Okay, so let's start off with number 29. So you've read the question and we know now that this is a rectangle. So when they tell us that the length of one diagonal, PN, is 7A minus 5, and the length of the other diagonal, MO, is 4A plus 7, well, we think about what's special about diagonals in a rectangle. And if you remember from our list, the diagonals in a rectangle are congruent. So if they're congruent, we're going to set them equal to each other. So we're going to do 7a minus 5 equals 4a plus 7. I'm going to subtract 4a from both sides. So now I have 3a minus 5 equals 7. Add 5. 3a equals 12. Divide both sides by 3, and A equals 4. So the question doesn't ask us just for A. It's asking for the length of PN. So we have to take that A. We have to plug it back in. So 7 times 4 minus 5. We're plugging it back in. 7 times 4 is 28. Minus 5 is 23. So the length of that diagonal PN is 23. A good check, plug it into the other one, and make sure that you get the same answer. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Number 30, everyone's favorite, proofs. Okay, let's take a look. All right, we're going to go step by step. It tells us that DE is parallel to HG. Now, we care about that because... From there, we can figure out alternate interior angles, corresponding angles, um, alternate exterior angles, lots of good information from knowing lines are parallel. Now, those same lines that are parallel are also congruent. Okay, our goal is going to be to prove that EF is congruent to FG. Now, the only way that we can prove that is if we first prove that the two triangles are congruent. So we're thinking about all of our different proofs. Angle, side, angle, side, angle, side, yada, yada. Now let's go ahead and walk through the proof to see what's missing and what we need to fill in. Now the first one talks about the given information, and they include that DE is congruent to HG. So that right there gave us a side length that was congruent between the two. Now the next one says angle D is congruent to angle H. Okay, now those two are congruent because of that Zaro Z, if you remember. So if we trace the Z in this one, we would see D and H land in the corners, right? So that's our first set of angles. And then we have angle E being congruent to angle G. And again, if I trace the Zaro Z, those would fall in the corner as well. So again, I have a second pair of angles, A's. So the reason in this proof that they state that those two sets of angles are congruent is because of alternate interior angle theorem, that the alternate interior angles are congruent if your lines are parallel. In other words, it's the Z stuff. Now, the two triangles are congruent, and the question is why? What proof method allows us to say that they're congruent? So taking a look at what we have, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. So we have this angle, this angle. Then we have E and G, and then we have our side length. Okay, so we have an angle, then a side, and then an angle. So we have an, two pairs of angles and the side in between them, which means we're using ASA, angle side angle theorem. All right, let's move on to the next question. Oh, before we do that, actually, notice that the last step, EF is congruent to GF. The reason here is CPCTC, which means corresponding angles, or rather corresponding parts, it could be angles or sides, so corresponding parts of congruent triangles, so the matching parts of congruent triangles are themselves congruent. So corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And that's what CPCTC stands for. Okay, so in order to use CPCTC, we first have to prove that the two triangles are congruent. And then all their parts that match up will, of course, be congruent as well. All right, let's move on to the next question, number 31. 
All right, so let's take a look at this question. Now, you, hopefully you've read through it. Um, we're going to be comparing the area of the rectangle before and after. So this little rectangle at the bottom, RVTS, I'm going to highlight that. Let's say we're going to use some variables here, and we're going to call the base B and then the height of the little rectangle H. So when they've doubled it, they've created another height of H. So the entire height of the new rectangle, the big one, is going to be 2H. So the first one says that the area of the new rectangle, the big one, RSXY, is two square units greater than the area of the smaller one. So just two units larger, not two times, not two less, but two times, um, two units more. So let's think about what the area would be for the little green triangle. The area of the green one would be just be base times height. Now the big one, the area of the big rectangle, is going to be base times your height of 2H. In other words, it's going to be 2 times base times height. So if I'm comparing the two, I have just a regular base times height, and then I have 2 times base times height. So that means that the area of the big rectangle is going to be twice as large, 2 times as large, as a smaller green rectangle. So I'm going to go with choice I that says it's 2 times the area of the smaller rectangle. It's not 4, it's not 8, and it's not 2 plus units. Let's go on to the next question. So we've skipped 32 and we're on to 33. Now it's asking you for the distance from point A to the midpoint of BC. Now we don't have the midpoint of BC right now. We need to figure out where is that midpoint of BC before we can even figure out what the distance is. So what we're going to do first is we're going to find the midpoint of BC. If you recall your midpoint formula, you're averaging your endpoint. So it's going to be x1 plus x2 divided by 2, and then y1 plus y2 divided by 2. Now we're going to do that to BC. C is at 0, negative 6, and B is at 1, 2, 3, 4. Six. All right, so we're going to figure out what's halfway between them. So if I'm adding my x value, 0 plus 4 divided by 2, the halfway point is 2. Now the y value is negative 6 plus 6. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0. Divide that by 2 and you still get 0. So that means our midpoint is going to be at 2, 0. I'm going to put a point there for my midpoint. 2, 0. Okay, it's crossing the x-axis right there. All right, now I'm going to draw a line that connects A to that midpoint. And that's what I need to find the length of. I'm going to draw in my right triangle the way that we usually do and use Pythagorean theorem to figure out the length of AM. So if I draw in my triangle, I'm going to draw it going down and then over. So my vertical length here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 boxes. And then my horizontal length is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 boxes. So I'm going to do 8 squared plus 6 squared equals my C squared, the length of AM. That's your hypotenuse. All right, zooming out, I have 8 squared plus 6 squared equals C squared. 8 squared is 64, 6 squared is 36, and that gives me c squared. Add them together, I get 100. Square root of 100 is 10. So 10 is the length of my hypotenuse c. And let's see if we got that. Yep, it's going to be choice g. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so here we're going to solve for x. Now, all of these ratios, they're talking about trig, so let's see which of our trig ratios we can use. Now, there are, there are two different right triangles in this diagram. I'm going to break out both so I can take a look and see which one's going to give me what I need. Okay, so I have 37 degrees here. And I have x, which is missing, 
And then the triangle on the right shares that same x. They have a hypotenuse of 25 and a little angle of 53 on the inside. Okay, now if I take a look at the triangle on the left, I don't have any side length that I could use with my trig ratios. All I have is the opposite side x that I'm looking for and everything else is missing. So I can't use that triangle on the left. I have to use a triangle on the right with my trig ratios. Now if I take a look at what I have, I'm looking for x, which is the opposite. The adjacent is missing. I don't have anything for the adjacent, so I'm going to cross that out. And 25 is my hypotenuse. So if I have O and H, that means I should be using sine. So, so cut toa, sine. So I should write down sine of my angle, which is 53, should equal the opposite x over my hypotenuse of 25. Okay, so I should look for that as an answer. And it's going to be choice D. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So number 35, you're asked to find the scale factor. If you remember, scale factor is always the fraction new over old. Now we can use coordinates if it's centered at the origin, your dilation. We could use a new length or an old length. Or we can use distance from the center before and after. So in this case, pay attention to what our new is. Our new is this, is this triangle R prime, T prime, S prime, that smaller triangle that's going to be towards V. So I have information about how far T prime is from V. Now V is going to be my center of dilation. How do I know that? Is because all of the points, if you trace them back, if you trace R to R prime with a straight line, T to T prime and S to S prime, where they all cross, that's at V. So V has to be your center of dilation. This will work with any dilation that you do. If you trace your points back with a straight line, wherever all the lines cross, that's your center of dilation. So in this case, our new distance from our center of dilation V to T prime, our new distance is 12. Our old distance, which was further away, V to our regular t is 18. So 12 to 18 is our scale factor. We just need to simplify. So 12 and 18, the GCF is going to be 6. So I can divide the top and the bottom by 6. So 12 divided by 6 is going to be 2. 18 divided by 6 is going to be 3. So 2 thirds is a scale factor of your reduction. It's less than 1, so that's how we know it's definitely a reduction. And your figure shrunk. So in this little box, we're going to put 2, division symbol, 3. Okay, so in this, we have two triangles that share a side. Reflexive property, BD is congruent to BD, so they share that side. And they share a second set of sides. And the question is asking about angle 2 and 3, which one's larger, which one's smaller. Now, this is an application of the hinge theorem. Now, in order to figure out which angle is larger, we have to take a look at the side length across from the angles. So across from angle 2, we have a side length of 10.5. Now, in the other triangle, aside from angle 3, is a length of 10.05. The one that's larger is 10.5. So that means angle 2 has to be larger than angle 3 because it has a larger side length across from it. It had to open up wider to accommodate the longer side. So in our choices, the one that reflects that is choice I. Angle 2 is larger than angle 3. And that finishes out this video, and stay tuned to the next video as we continue on.